Senhoras e senhores, boa tarde. Agradecemos. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We would like to thank all of you for being here this Tuesday afternoon. At this time, we would like to invite to the floor the Minister of the Acting uh, President of the Republic, Mr. Geraldo Alckmin. We would like to invite Mrs. Ether Dweck, Minister of Management, Innovation and Public Services. We would like to invite the Executive Secretary of the Ministry of Science and Technology and Innovation, Mr. Luis Manuel Rebelo Fernandes. And we would also like to invite the Director President to the Center for Management and Strategic Studies, the Brazil Innovation Center, Fernando Rizzo. We would like to begin our ceremony by asking everyone to please stand for the national anthem. Lecture, the tension between the United States and China changes in the global semiconductor's value chain will highlight the recent transformations in the global semiconductor landscape, underlying how tensions between the United States and China are reconfiguring the value chain of this 
are reconfiguring the value chain of this essential component of modern technology and how the scenario of technological disputes between the US and China opens windows of opportunities for countries like Brazil and the semiconductor sector. Professor Kyun Li from the Department of Economics at the Seoul National University will offer insights into the current dynamics of the industry, paying particular attention to the changes taking place in Asia and the implications for the leadership position of the United States in the middle and long terms. Furthermore, the strategic response of the United States aimed at constraining China's technological development and the consequences of this stance for other relevant countries in the global semiconductor industry. We will foster a, a dialogue that will count on the participation of Augusto Cadeira, who is currently the manager of the National Center for Advanced Electronic Te and professor at the Federal University of Rio. To welcome them, I would like to invite to the floor the directing president of the Center for Management and Strategic Studies, the Brazilian Innovation Center, Mr. Fernando Rizzo. Good afternoon, everyone. Initially, I would like to greet the presence of Dr. Gerald Walkman, President of the Republic, Acting President, and Minister of Industry, Commerce, and Services, Minister Esther Dweck from Management and Innovation and Public Services, Mr. Fernando, Executive Secretary of the Ministry of Science, Technology, and Innovation, and also all of the other authorities who are here, ladies and gentlemen. The globalized nature and strongly specialized sector of semiconductors is practically a common sense between those who study that topic. Historically, the first industries of semiconductors that were comprised in the U.S. in the 50s and 60s of the last century, fostered by the support from the Department of Defense Research of institutions and universities in the US, as well as by public acquisitions aimed at supplying the armed forces. Nonetheless, very quickly, the pioneer companies of the sector noticed about the encompassing possibilities of semiconductors and solutions of civil interest. And since then, they have become diversified and most recently have gained breath with the emergency of the 4.0 um, and Internet of Things and artificial intelligence and quantum computing to mention just a few. As the market for semiconductors has become more diversified, accelerated by interest and access to new applications and spaces, the industry has also gone through transformation that are relevant. They had very important implications about business models of companies that began to have on their agenda the geopolitical powers of the main technological potencies, given the news of the sector and the possibilities of in national insertion. During this process, the semiconductor sector grew not only due to the protagonism of the United States, but also the creativity and audacity of aspiring countries that conquered in the global chain their relevant positions. In this brief historic exercise or practice, we should note that Japan in the 80s was a competitor, a fierce competitor that threatened the dominance of the United States. In the following decade, we note the emergency of South Korea as a potency for technological incentive for strategic position in the sector, taking front, for example, in the memory sectors. Taiwan, through a very significant and continuous effort comprised a leading industry that currently dominates the production of more advanced chips in smaller scales. Other countries took advantage of their local competencies, became competitive in fundamental assets, as is the case of, of Holland, with lithography and other equipment. These examples help us to bring into context the recent changes in the sector. In addition to imposing a point of view of the process for insertion of new countries, new aspiring countries, China, despite its difficulties, has been conquering great advances in the last decade, especially in the domain of more mature technologies. Furthermore, the application of China in frontier developments as artificial intelligence seems to indicate that the country has competence for leapfrogging and perhaps weakening um, the United States leaderships in the middle and long terms. If that happens, it will also be a topic of discussion. The United States government for some years has been moving to limit 
Chinese development and technology considered to be strategic in, strate in national defense and suing in uh, an act that inhibits other countries. At the same time, this has been uh, resisted by local companies, not only for the significance of the Chinese market, but also to the level of integration, economic integration between the United States and China. The CGEE, the Brazilian um, Innovation Center, has been studying mechanisms to support innovation in Brazil. Let us highlight the efforts in monitoring the computing laws, policies for technology, uh, IT sector, and communication sector, and also as regards semiconductors. We've carried out studies about organic semiconductors. Currently, the CGEE is carrying out two qualitative studies about the impact of the computing law and program to su for the technological support of semiconductors on beneficiary companies with the objective of fostering the R&D uh, sector in Brazil and identifying future challenges. Navigating in such difficult waters is not an easy task. Historically, Brazil is very pragmatic with its foreign relations and it does not take one side of this tension. Nonetheless, having understanding of this geopolitics is essential. As in the absence of such knowledge, we go, we run the risk of anachronism, the CGE, has as its objective to foster dialogue and competence and is very happy to bring together in this panel and it greets Kyun Lee for the opportunity of listening to him and talking to him about such important aspects. We are convinced that this afternoon we will listen to information that will renew our assessment of this sector as well as instigate us in the decision-making process, be it in government or companies, so that we can have a more strategic stance about the role Brazil can have in the future. So perhaps it is something that we need to learn and teach in Brazil as to what to do and what not to do. Thank you very much. Following, I pass the floor to the Executive Secretary of the Ministry of Science, Technology, and Innovation, Luis Manuel Rebelo Fernandes. Good afternoon to all. I would like to, first of all, greet President Geraldo Alckmin, which it is an honor to have his presence here at the table. Minister Stadweck, Fernando Rizzo, President Director of the CGE, which is a social organization that is connected to the Ministry of Science and Technology and Innovation. I would like to greet Professor Kum Lee, which is also a pleasure to have you here and your intelligence here. In this debate, Augusto Gadelha, who received a singular mission from the government, he has the mission to liquidate Siteki and to not liquidate Siteki. He has this contradiction in his role. Uh, and I would also like to greet Secretary Wallace. I know he has worked with Professor Lee in South Korea. And on behalf of them, I would like to greet all of you here today. I think this is a very important debate because the world is undergoing profound and accelerated transportation within which international tensions are strengthened. And we see more and more that there are areas, technological frontier areas that used to be dealt with explicitly as neutral areas, they are becoming more and more subordinated to the interference of explicit geopolitical interferences with uh, restrictions in terms of transfer of technology and attempts to block or hinder. And this is very significantly in the area of semiconductors. These tensions lived by the world in the past years, worsened by the context of the pandemics, have revealed very clearly and explicitly that the countries that do not have national capacity to produce and develop in strategic areas are vulnerable to foreign interference that are incapable of sustaining their own development. And this is the core topic that we would like to debate here today. I'd like to congratulate the MGK and CGE for bringing such an experienced person to talk to us to 
provide us elements to discuss this evolution. And this is an area in which our three ministries, together with other areas of the government, have cooperated intensely. Together, we have participated of the working group that studies scenarios to preserve national production capacities in the area of semiconductors, which is materialized into Mitteki, so it is a crime against Brazil to promote its termination, but we thankfully we were able to revert this termination, so we are undergoing the revitalization of a semiconductor company. Also, as a result of this cooperation between the ministries, we extend and renewed the Pajis, including other elements under the coverage of this program to support national semiconductors, and we do this internally aligned with the discussions that are being conducted in the National Council for Industrial Development to promote reindustrialization in on new grounds in the country based on the semiconductor industry, a strategic area of this effort to for the national in reindustrialization. I think the partnership between our ministries is materialized on the figure of Verena, which is our executive secretary for the council. She comes from the CGE and has been summoned by the Ministry of Development, Technology and Innovation to lead the design of the new industrial policy, promoting a, a coming together of all these efforts taken upon by the government. And to know the tensions, it is important in order to see where we stand and in order to prepare a program. But we must understand, as Hizo said, it is we do not we do not need to be automatically aligned with anybody in these tensions. We should not take sides. We should strengthen relationships, international relationships to take advantage of the arenas that are open and to promote Brazil's developments in knowledge society's development. I am sure that the debate here will assist us in carrying out this policy. At this time, at this time, we would like to invite Minister of Management and Innovation and Public Services, Esther Dweck. Thank you. I would first of all like to greet President Geraldo Alckmin. It is a pleasure to be with you, sir, uh, as acting president. It is an honor for us to have you in our building. I would also like to greet the Executive Secretary, Luis Fernandes. Oh. I would like to greet the Executive Ministry of uh, Executive Secretary of Ministry of Science and Technology. It's a pleasure to have you here, and the Director President of the Brazilian Innovation Center, Fernando Rizzo. I would like to greet MGIC, and as Minister of the MGIC and CG for organizing this on behalf of Wallace and Caroline Pereira, who organized this event and have made it possible for us to be together with such an important and relevant topic. I would like to greet Verena and our two speakers. Kun Lee, thank you for being here. We will also meet in Rio, but this is an opportunity for us to be together. We have a lot of employees from the Ministry of Management, MG, watching our lecture. And at the ministry, we've been placing great effort to have this interaction with academia and government. I'm a professor, so for me, this is extremely important. Next week, we'll have another professor that is very important worldwide who, in our partnership, this is Professor, professor Mariana Mazzucato will be with us, so we will have this continuity of this interaction between the government and academia and international academia, which is extremely important for us. It addresses the frontiers, geopolitical issues, in an essential area. So for us, this is truly an opportunity. So I'd like to greet Augusto Gadelha too, who is in this uh, mission, as Executive Secretary said, our Secretary Elisa, whose birthday it is today. So happy birthday, Elisa. She's our Secretary for Coordination of State-Owned Companies, and, in, and she's she's been a bit easier in her mission we removed the de-statization secretariat 
this was a process to dismantle the Brazilian state, and we're reverting this process with this idea that um, we have of reverting this dismantling that we have been able to do in time in an area that is so relevant. And in fact, I think the topic of our seminar is very important because in fact, it places the production of a strategic supply in the geopolitical dispute. I think we need to understand that this is part of a very broad discussion that goes through geopolitics. Perhaps we are now at a, at a rare moment of world history where we are disputing this hegemony after some time, Jap there was a question if Japan was in fact a uh, dispute with the United States. We still had the Cold War then, so the dispute was much more focused on the Soviet Union. Japan was a, a technological threat, but not one of hegemony, but not China. China has really made a project to have this dispute in several areas, and it has been able to do so in the 80s when the great studies about the importance of semiconductors began. China was not a relevant player, and currently, without a doubt, it is one of the relevant players that is capable of promoting or generating this technological uprising in the world. I think it is very important for us to understand that that's what we're dealing with, a much, more, a much broader situation. And I think the pandemic has reiterated, underscored the importance of the state's action in a broader point of view. We highlight the importance of SUS to the Brazilians, a unified health system, to show how it is strategic for us to have a unified health system, but also the productive autonomy is one of the most uh, important issues that has arisen post-pandemic. We know that strategic supplies and semiconductors, for example, as well as microchips, this, these were supplies that disappeared, and this generated worldwide problems. We're having inflation as a result, so we have an important geopolitical and economic discussion that goes through this sector, and we need to understand that we need to discuss it very broadly. So for us, for us, it is very important to discuss this at the ministry. I would like to once again thank you for having made this uh, meeting possible. For people to be able to listen to this and to listen to Gadeira so that we can understand how Brazil can be a player in this scenario. I believe the pandemic has brought forth this productive autonomy discussion, as well as important changes to the global supply chains. Were they truly global? Are they local? How does Brazil play a part? So we believe that this will not necessarily be as simple as we believe and how we need to have our own capacity to truly be able to be a part of a chain with greater technological potential. And it is extremely important to have someone, as Professor Kim Lee, who understands this catching up strategy, as Korea is a, an undeniable example of these strategies as China, and for us to be able to think of how we can think about having this as our objective We've had other moments in history. We have had an important catching up process and for several geopolitical issues, we've been uh, set back and we're now going back to becoming an important player. And so now we would also like to have in mind that we would like to be a technological player as well. Thank you once again and have a wonderful debate. Ladies and gentlemen, I pass the floor to the Acting President of the Republic, Geraldo Alckmin. Good afternoon to all. First, I would like to greet our host, Minister Esther Dweck, Luis Manuel Fernandes, Executive Secretary of the Ministry of Science Technology. Fernando Rizzo, President, Direction of the Center, CGEE, -E, Professor Kum Lee, Professor of the Department of Economics of the University of Seoul. Welcome. I welcome you to our country. Greet Professor Augusto Cesar Gadelha, which takes 
on which is responsible for state packing to greet Wallace Morita, our Secretary for Industry Innovation, Trade and Services that lived in Korea and worked with Professor Kum to greet all friends. It is a pleasure to be here with all of you. We have a major challenge in front of us. Brazil, in the past decades, suffered a major deindustrialization, which was accelerated and too soon. It was premature. And we must see what causes what caused the deindustrialization in order to be able to contain it. So it is a very important debate on how can we act upon the causes of deindustrialization in Brazil and how can we promote a new industry, a neo-industrialization that is green with decarbonization, a new industrialization with digitalization and innovation. And this, Minister that I would like to point out the approval, the passing of the new law that established TR, the most inexpensive taxes that exist, less than 2% aimed at research, development, digitalization, and innovation. And also the new Badges, which removes all import taxes, all of them, to on semiconductors and photovoltaic energy. So, trying to propel strategic areas in the Brazilian economy. I am sure that this meeting will bring will shed light and will bring interesting discussions for us to move forward and further promote the Brazilian development. Semiconductors today are present in our lives daily since the games the children play to the armament industry and Brazil needs to take its place as the fifth largest country in the world in territorial extension, the seventh more populated country among the 10 greatest economies with excellent universities, research centers, diversified industries. We must seek our path, we must find our path to be part of this such important momentum of the population's lives. I would like to greet Minister Esther for her excellent initiative and greet all of you that are going to participate in this debate. Thank you. In, at this time, we would like to close this opening ceremony and because of their agenda, we would like to thank for the presence and we'd like to say our farewell to the Acting President, Mr. Gerald Ockman, and the Minister of Innovation and Public Services, uh, Minister Estadweck, we ask that you please uh, stay in your places so that we can continue our program. And the Organization Committee would like to remind you that those who would like to use the interpretation equipment, the radios are at your disposal at the entrance of this auditorium.
Mais uma vez solicitamos aos que We would like to ask you once again uh, for you to use the simultaneous interpretation equipment that is available to you at the entry of this auditorium. Pergunta se ele quer falar do público na mesa. Não, é porque ele prefere falar do público na mesa. Não, não, não. Ixi. E aí, e aí, e Obrigado. 
Oh, it's English. Yes, yes. Sorry, we don't have it in, in Korean. Oh, no, no. no. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it's good. It's good. It's English. Much better. Much better. They can further. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Boa, mais uma vez, boa tarde, senhoras e senhores. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We would like to ask you once again to please take your seat so we can continue our event. Once again, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let us continue our event. At this time, we would like to welcome our guest, Professor Kumli, distinguished scholar at the Seoul National University Department of Economics and the former vice chairman of the National Economic Advisory Council to the president of South Korea. Kumli holds a PhD in economics from the University of California at Berkeley and is the winner of the 2014 Schupinter Prize and the 2019 Cap Prize of the European Association for Evolutionary Political Economy. He is former president of the International Schupinterian Society and member of the Global Future Council of the World Economic Forum, as well as author of several works of international relevance. The theme of today's lecture is the tension between the US and China and the changes in the global semiconductor value chain. We would like to invite Professor Kuhn Lee to start his presentation. Professor, the floor is yours. I would like to pass the floor to the professor and I hope you have a wonderful event. Thank you. Um, I'm Kuni. It's great to be on this occasion. It's my great honor to be a speaker at this uh, occasion in the presence of uh, your acting president and many uh, ministers of the different uh, ministries. Uh, maybe I can uh, stand here to uh, talk. <laughs> so my talk today is about uh, U.S. China tension and changing global value chain in semiconductors. I guess uh, today is all spoke about importance of uh, semiconductor. That's the, uh, my topic today. Okay. Next. Next. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, this shows the recovery from all economy around the world from uh, COVID-19. So we have a uh, experiencing V-shaped recovery. Okay, but uh, this does not mean we are simply going back to old days. We are now entering totally different world. Okay, next. The new world might be terms as deglobalization. So I think these studies uh, in several sequences, starting from 2008 global financial crisis, which was brought to financial globalization. Then there was a Brexit 2016. Then importantly 2018 with Trump, uh, there was a US-China trade war. Okay. Then might be begin of uh, uh, set against trade-based globalization. Okay. Then we have a pandemic, which was deep blow to the uh, uh, production globalization. Because if you have a uh, production too much out of your territory, then you are more subject to bigger risk from fragmentation of value chain. So we see the uh, uh, eroding of a uh, uh, multilateral free trade system, the emergence of a uh, uh, smaller alliance-based value chain 
or the IPTF, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Uh, these are new, different kind of uh, framework. Okay. Then there is a Russia-Ukraine war, which is also a uh, deglobalization in terms of uh, agricultural goods and financial market because uh, we restricted uh, Russia against use of SWIFT. That means uh, kind of uh, beginning of a dollar exit phenomena happening gradually over the world. Okay. Next. So I see there are uh, several important factors affecting uh, GBC changes. And especially there is uh, uh, something called China exit. Many companies are moving out of China. Okay. And then to, uh, uh, we see trend of reshoring or neoshoring or somebody called friendly shoring. Okay. So first, uh, impact for uh, factor for uh, causing exit China is that, of course, US China trade conflict, which charges tariff against Chinese export which is a push factor for uh, trade or FDI diversion out of China to uh, neighboring Asian countries. It's called neoshoring. Then also because rise of Chinese from competitiveness, many companies are losing competition in China market. Samsung used to have a China market market share of more than 20%. Now less than 1%. <laughs> losing by competition. So Samsung already moved the manufacturing out of China to Vietnam or other countries. Okay. And also now digitization makes uh, 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 you build your smart factory automation in home countries, which makes reshoring possible because uh, Chinese wage rate already very expensive, almost 70, 80 percent of Korea. So no more reason to stay in China for the low wages, low, low wage gone. If you turn to digital factory, smart factory, you can build the same factory in Korea, which is uh, uh, less using labor. So there might be on technical region, which enables reshoring or reshoring out of China. And finally, COVID-19, and many governments trying to give incentive for their company coming back home, financial incentives. So these factors are the uh, China exit. China used to be a factory of the world. But now, uh, less and less so because of these factors. Okay. Next. So this shows uh, uh, changing location of Korean investment in China. Korea used to invest more to China, more than Japan. But now, uh, this is China, but it's getting less and less because we are moving to Vietnam, out of China. Okay. And uh, uh, in terms of share of value added, FDI cases, share of employment, Vietnam becoming uh, more and more uh, bigger than the than China location as a location for Korean investment in Asia. Next. Next. This shows how Samsung is uh, moving their factory out of uh, China to Vietnam. So starting from uh, their fish factory shut down and smartphone factory shut down and others, they're all moving to uh, Vietnam, northern part of Vietnam, which is close to China border. Okay, so Vietnam is biggest beneficiary of this uh, chain global chain. Okay, in Latin, in America, Mexico is the biggest beneficiary of this uh, changing global 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 value chain. Next. So, uh, in terms of uh, current export to China, there is a big decline. China is the biggest Korea, Korea trading partner. Korean trade U.S. plus Japan was even smaller than Korean trade to China. But now, big drop, US share increase, almost getting sim similar in, in uh, size. So uh, both countries, about 20% of uh, Korean uh, trading partners, used to be China much bigger, more than 25%. Okay. So last year, Korea trade current account balance, we had China with a big deficit of $6 billion. But we have a big 70 billion surplus with the US. Quite reversal. Before we used to have big surplus with China, we turned to deficit. Now big surplus coming from not from China, from US. Big change in China. Okay. So Samsung kit, Samsung already uh, uh, moved their factory out of China, except uh, three things. First is semiconductors, battery for electrical vehicle, and MLCs with components. So all those uh, important capital uh, goods are remain in China, but all 
consumer assembly part already moved, moved out of China. Okay, next. So this shows the uh, now U.S. importing less and less from China, but more from other low-cost Asian countries, and uh, South Asia becoming a most uh, uh, beneficial of reshoring away from China. So this is change of U.S. import sources. Vietnam biggest gain. Thailand, India, Mexico, where China is losing a lot. So it shows important change in uh, global value chain. Next. So from China point of view, so China facing two traps, two challenges. One is uh, how to go beyond middle income trap. The other is a uh, uh, two serious trap, which I call TT, which means that uh, uh, I define uh, China's economic slowdown, possibly due to the US containment policy against China. We call the uh, practice. So these are two important challenges facing China. So let me discuss briefly. Next. So in my uh, uh, current book, I discussed uh, uh, in the several chapters on semiconductors, but this is touching up other sectors too. Next. So uh, to assess China's possibility of going beyond middle income trap, we have to look at several indicators. First, whether China is innovative enough and whether they're donating world-class big businesses or they are how much they are doing in terms of equity or inequalities. These are three criteria we can assess China's uh, possibility of middle income trap. Next. So this is the indicator of middle income trap, which is measuring each country's per capita GDP in PPP against US. So Germany is about 90% US level. And Japan, Korea is 70%, similar level. This is uh, Brazil and China, almost 30%. So to go beyond middle income trap, you have to cross more than 40%. That's the benchmark of joining high income countries. And China Brazil has almost 10% gap, still uh, so, some uh, gap to catch up. Okay? And uh, uh, China's slope is increasing, but Brazil is somewhat flat. So that's uh, some challenge facing uh, Brazil. The Korean slope very fast. Mm -hmm. We're catching up mm -hmm. to level mm -hmm. of Japan or France and UK. Okay. So if I project uh, this trend for the next uh, 10 decade, China might reach 40% around uh, mid 2030s. Mm -hmm. So by that time, China will become high income countries if everything goes okay. okay. Next. Mm -hmm. And this is number of patent filed in US, of course. US, Japan is number one, too. Then uh, until seven years ago, Korea was number three, but now China became number three. China surpassed Korea and Germany. So China, Korea, Germany is the uh, third, fourth, fifth in terms of US patent. So this is a major innovation, one major innovation. So in China is very innovative. Okay. Next. This is the big world-class big business measured by the number of Fortune Global 500 companies. So out of 500, US used to have about 200. But after this IT bubble burst, it keep decreasing less and less. Now recently, China has more Fortune 500 companies than US. So China is now generating more big business than US. It's very important implication. Okay? And this is Japan. Japan has two lost arcade. Used to be almost 150, but now less than uh, uh, 60. So Japan is slowed down, corresponding to slowdown in terms of global 500 companies. China used to have only two in 1995, but now generated more than 130, more than US. Okay, next. But China problem, same problem as the US in terms of inequality. This shows top 10 riches uh, people share in their income. U.S. is very high, more than 40%. China also 40%. <laughs> so China also having the same problem as the inequality. In that sense, China might be okay in terms of middle income trap, in terms of innovation and big business, but not sure in terms of handling inequalities. Okay. So here, inequality is coming from, not from wages, but from asset-based income. Real estate, estate and the financial asset. Same problem as the U.S. capitalism. Next. So uh, to discuss uh, TT, we have to look at look at uh, uh, China's size. Okay. Next. 
So this shows China's size in global GDP. China now reached almost 17%. Uh, and exactly where, that's where Japan used to be in mid-1990. So Japan used to be 20% of world GDP, but keep decreasing less than 5%. So uh, from hope that China might be like Japan, but it doesn't seem to be the case. It keep uh, catching up. Okay. Next. Then this important graph, measuring China against US in terms of current GDP size. Okay. China reaching now uh, almost uh, 75%. But from 2020 to uh, 21 to 20, big drop. Okay. China used to be a uh, 76 percent to US 2021, but dropped by five percentage point 22 because of a lockdown. Okay, so that means China is to be catching up on the trajectory. Then, if you extend the China will be become US around 2000, mid 2030, 2030. But now, because of this uh, drop, if you extend this graph, China will reach US size by. 2040, mid 2040. So there is now more than 10 year delay of China's catching up to US because of this uh, uh, lockdown. So this uh, slowdown of China happened not because of US reaction to contain China, but mostly because of COVID-19. <laughs> okay. yeah. So China's lockdown has a huge impact on uh, China. China is still not fully recovering from this uh, uh, side impact of COVID lockdown. Even Shanghai, all locked down. Yeah, it also too much damaging uh, to China's economy. So this is from uh, IMF data. I draw just uh, pictures. Okay. Next. So I think we are now going into uh, not G2, but S2. G2 means two countries are co collaborating. But now, if they don't, I call it split two. So we're moving into not G2, but split two uh, period. I think all the split in three dimensions. First, uh, we have seen now two big powers, almost similar sizes. Okay, U.S. never faced any country close to 80% of U.S. sizes. If China, even if China slowing down, is almost sure China will reach 80%, 90% of U.S. in 10 years. U.S. never faced such situation. So that means uh, we are uh, uh, going in period of uh, split too. Next, in terms of another split, in terms of GBC. So we see now there's uh, two GBC. One is US led GBC, the other is China led GBC. Okay. And another split is in terms of system values. Okay. China is uh, adopting different values, different system from US. Okay, China call, uh, we don't adopt Western democracy. China, we are adopting socialism with the Chinese uh, 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 as, uh, attribute. And in this split, Russia Ukraine war is another important uh, event which makes this split more uh, serious. Okay. Mm. Of course, dividing land is sometimes ambiguous because India, member of both Quad and Shanghai Cooperation Organization, very Interesting cases of <laughs> next. So what's happening in China? China is this is a China GBC graph? GBC means that uh, here measuring uh, how much your export is based on foreign bill edit. High means that you are when you export, you use more foreign bill import. It will be high. Then your integration into world economy. China peak was 2001 and two. Since they keep declining, that means China trying to make everything made in China. They domesticate former imported goods into domestic production. This is more forced by Trump and others. The U.S. Uh, trying to uh, control access of China for uh, high tech. So China have, have to develop everything themselves. And this is happening. It's getting more and more so. It's the Chinaization of value chain. This is emergence of China as a value chain, not relying on import from abroad. Okay. So this is the extreme cases. Okay. Next. This is Korean, same graph. So Korea also is experiencing domestication. Korea also uh, uh, turning domestic product, replacing foreign imported goods. But 
from 2000 on, Korea increased because Korea joined globalization again based on building up domestic capability. We opened up again. So I call it uh, in, out, in pattern, a non-linear pattern. But China case, this part is gone. Keep the ground. <laughs> yeah, that's exceptional case. Of China. Okay. Next. So we see now uh, hegemony of war between two powers. It's high tech war in terms of semiconductors, 5G AI batteries. Also, it's a GBC war. So decoupling is very difficult in all the sectors, but at least partial decoupling possible in um, some sectors, except semiconductors. China already number one in batteries, in their own AI system and 5G, but only in semiconductors, China having difficulty in catching up all the product. That's our uh, talk today. Okay, next. So, uh, um, so what is Korean perception on this S2 tension? It's both, both good and bad. Also, some opportunities. First of all, if US didn't uh, impose this red against China, the scenario, scenario will be everything will be made in China. That means China is placing everything Korea used to produce in China Asian. At least by uh, owing to U.S. reaction against rise of China, okay. So that means some opportunity for Korean manufacturing companies. Otherwise, everything will be produced by Chinese company, and that process at least stop, and several sectors or slowing down, okay. So in this sense, Korea sees some benefit from U.S. reaction, okay. So Korea's uh, Taiwan, Japan having a strong bargaining power. As a supply. The US, if they don't want import from China, they have, they have import from Korea or Taiwan or Japan with two alternative sources. In that sense, Korea's some sectors uh, see more opportunity than just, just dangerous. Okay? Of course, globally, new world with protection is bad for Korea, but depending upon which product sectors, the calculation is different. So in a sense, some Korean companies see we might have opened in both market, U.S. market without China, and China market without U.S. <laughs> this one way to looking at this situation. Okay, and some Korean company or Japan company go both market. Okay, next. So important is the IRA Inflation Reduction Act which is uh, giving big subsidy for made in Northern American or FTA countries. Of course, it is a violation of the WTO rules, okay? But uh, good for some uh, Korean battery makers. So before this thing, uh, China was gaining big market shares in US market, especially CATL, number one global producer of batteries. But after this IR Act, this company value decreased by 20%. Whereas the Korean company, LG and Seoul, next to Seattle, increased 30% stock market valuation. Because they are benefiting from IRA. If US don't buy from Seattle, they have to buy from Korean company, electric batteries. Solar cell too. Because rise of a Chinese company, China company was 98% of solar wave per share globally. But after IRX, this company are losing uh, in terms of uh, high heavy cost. Some Korean companies are gaining because of a subsidy. So some Korean companies are almost dying in the market, but they are now uh, recovering due to the IRX. So this example of IRX giving some benefit to some company around the world. Okay. Next. Then now in GBC in uh, semiconductors, important act is Chips Act, which give big subsidy to any factory investment in U.S. territory. And this is not just economic calculation, but more to military security concern. Okay, all the missiles and arms using semiconductor chips. Of course, they use low-end chips, but today's semiconductor technology determine 20 years latest arms level of technology, including cruise missile. So for U.S., it is important to control China access to semiconductor because it affects 20 years later the level of Chinese arms or missiles. 
So they have to control now, okay? <laughs> it takes 20 years, okay? So, uh, uh, um, so this makes China company in semiconductor very difficult, okay? Chip says several guarded against China. For example, uh, nobody can export facility producing logic chips below uh, 14 nanometers, DRAM below 18 nanometers, NAND flash more than 128 layers. You cannot export any facility in this specification to China market. Whereas no US citizen are not allowed to involved in R&D production in China. This is the very severe uh, measures. Okay. Next. So this important uh, table I made uh, two, uh, two days ago. So these are three important chips. DRAM memory, NAND flash, ROG chips are the biggest three uh, item in market uh, uh, in sales volume. They are similar but different. Okay, DRAM is used mostly computers and graphic card. NAND flash for your USB drive tablet. ROG is very diversification from automobile and uh, uh, servers and very diverse. Okay, and ROG TSMC is number one. TSMC, and DRAM is uh, 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 Korea, Samsung, and Micron US is number in terms of they're producing uh, using uh, 12 nanometers uh, processing uh, technology. This global frontier, and this US restriction, Chinese frontier. So China, seven nanometer gap from the global frontier, about more than 10 nanometer gap with TSMC, but uh, also, but China catching up very fast in NAND flash. So in terms of entry barriers, NAND flash is lowest entry barriers. Not that difficult to enter. And ROG chips are very diverse segment. Low end chips, high end chips. Low end chips is uh, low entry barriers. It's not that difficult. Okay. But DRAM, very high entry barriers. Very high entry barriers. Because there is only single segment. And there is very uh, uh, so cycle technology, and you need uh, EUB mentioned by today to produce highly productive DRAM, which makes you uh, compatible in cost. So uh, uh, this shows the uh, global frontier, Chinese frontier, U.S. measures against uh, China become reaching global frontier technologies. So very specific. Uh, measures so China having difficulty in catching up leapfrogging in more in DRAM, high end logics, but less difficult in terms of NAND flashes. Okay. Next. So uh, this table shows the uh, uh, Korean company and Thai companies investment home, and US and China. Okay. So Samsung has. DRAM factory and NAND flash and ROGIC all in Korea, different cities. And uh, Samsung has uh, NAND flash in Xi'an, that's the hometown of Xi Jinping present. But no plant of DRAM abroad, no plant in US, no plant in China in DRAM. And ROGIC chips, they're trying to build factory in Texas Austin under construction. So this table show that DRAM is core essence of Samsung's capability. It doesn't invest DRAM in abroad, only keep at home. Okay. Logic chips, because logic market is growing in the US, uh, Samsung trying to compete TSMC in the US market. So they're building huge factory in uh, Texas, Austin. Okay. But Samsung and SK Hynix, another Korean semiconductor company, and they have no plant in the US, but they have many plants in China. In Wuxi, DRAM factory, Dalian, uh, NAND flash, but they don't have capacity in logic chips. Okay, but they have packaging in Chongqing. Samsung has also packaging in uh, Suzhou. Okay, I heard the brother is strong in packaging industry. So, uh, Hynex is more, facing more problem because uh, they have DRAM factory in Wuxi. If they cannot import EUB, they can upgrade this facility. Okay. So actually, uh, SK tried to import EUB into their Wuxi factory in China, but it was uh, checked. So they only DUB. DUB is old generation, one generation before uh, the EUB. 
in China, there is no single unit of EUV in China. When Suwon, Samsung, there are 50, more than 50 units of EUV in Samsung. <laughs> more than 50. But China, no one, no unit in EUV. Okay? So China only using DUV, which is one generation old one. Okay? So without EUV, China cannot catch up with the frontier. That's the problem facing China. Okay? EUV is made by ASLM in Netherlands. They produce only less than 70 units per year. When China ordered the import, it was stopped. <laughs> okay. And, uh, 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 okay, yeah, next. So, Korea and Taiwan has having some difficulty because they have to have two separate GBC. One for targeting US, Western Europe market, the other targeting China market. China market is very big, okay, important. But we cannot upgrade because of this U.S. restriction. That's our uh, problem. Okay. So, uh, but as I mentioned, Samsung has no factory in China in DRAM, only NAND flash, which is less uh, difficult to uh, 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 produce without even EUB. NAND flash doesn't require EU EUB. You can produce NAND flash without EUB. That's why China catching up very fast in NAND flash, even if it's just DUB. Okay. So does not require EUB production. U.S. Uh, know that uh, if they restrict too much Korean factory in China, then they will lose competitiveness to Chinese company. So they become very flexible, adjusting their level of restriction, uh, adjusting every year. Following the catching up of China company, they allow more investment uh, uh, according to level of growth of Chinese company. Okay. <coughs> Next. So, uh, how Korea caught up in the past? Korea is behind Japan, okay? But Korea leapfrog over Japan in memory because in the, from two steps. First step, we imported the equipment from US, Japan, and borrowed US design, German design, only produced. That's early stages. Later, we tried leapfrogging to acquire design capability by setting up R&D labs in Silicon Valley. So Samsung turned from producer, now able to do design. And Samsung leapfrog in the sense that China, Samsung target one generation ahead of Japan. That's leapfrogging. Okay. During downturn. So during downturn, US company, Japan company very weak. They are conscious not to make the investment. But during downturn, Samsung did massive investment. Next generation facility, ahead of Japan. That's what Samsung achieved, leapfrogging, ahead of Japan. Okay. So in the sense, China cannot try leapfrogging because they cannot import EUB or other facilities. So leapfrogging DM is uh, almost impossible for China. Okay. But they can target low-end logic chips in uh, like uh, those for automobiles. This is low end chips and still big market. So China heavily uh, now focusing on low end chips for cars and uh, electricity and so on. Okay. Also, they might try some different uh, trajectory, not using Western technology in uh, some new uh, segment, but it's not very uh, um, easily, a lot of uncertainty. How can China can do it? Okay. At least China catching up might be delayed for at least for more than 10 years. Okay, yeah. Next. So this shows a semiconductor value chain starting from low-end value chain, packaging, testing, mid-end fabrication, high-end mask design. Samsung enter from these stages, they move to here, eventually move to here. So Samsung achieve upgrading in semiconductor value chain through last uh, uh, several decades, starting from here, mid and high value chain. Okay. And many companies around the world uh, just stay at mid and high end. Few achieve catching up to front, except Korea, Taiwan. Okay. Next. This show Taiwan cases. In terms of value, uh, value chain, the uh, packaging part used to be very big, 
but getting smaller, smaller, the rise of fabrication part and rise of design part, high end, middle end, low end. This shows a steady catching up in terms of value chain in semiconductor. Similar experience happened in Samsung and uh, Taiwan companies. Okay. Next. This show uh, uh, price of uh, different generation of uh, memory chips. You know the USB chips. If you have a new generation, new capacity uh, chips, all generation price go down because bigger capacity and same prices. So demand for all generation go to zero. Price go to zero. That means it's very difficult to lay come to catch up starting from low end. That typical catch up threat, you, you start from low end, then move high end. When Ethereum, there is no low high end. Only one <laughs> uniform market. And all generation go to price zero. So that's why DRAM uh, market competition very difficult for late to enter from low end. There are no low end in memory chips. Only uniform market. Okay. Next. Oops. There was some graph <laughs> showing how Samsung catch up uh, with the uh, Japanese income band. So this is GDM generation up to uh, uh, 16 megabyte uh, memory chip. Samsung was behind Japan. But from 1990, Samsung ahead of Japan from 16 megabyte uh, memory chips. And during that time, Samsung did mass investment ahead of Japan, targeting next generation memory facility ahead of Japan. Okay. So Samsung was behind. Samsung become ahead of Japan from uh, 64 megabyte uh, memory chips. Next. And DRAM is semiconductor is subject to cycles, begin cycle. This up and down, begin cycle. And the catch up strategy is during downturn, you did mass investment. Okay? So this is a typical leapfrogging strategy. During downturn, don't be weak, but try to be bold to make next investment. That's a typical leapfrogging catch up strategy done by Samsung against Japan or Intel. This shows a generation of different uh, 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 memory chips. Up, down, the next wave up, down, the another wave up. Next. And so for what's happening in China, as I mentioned, China cannot access production facility and front technology. So leapfrogging getting very difficult. This shows the level of technological frontiers. TSMC, Samsung reaching 30, 30 nanometers. But some uh, China bios company, uh, SMIC, still producing 12 or 14 nanometers. But this is good. This is for chips for automobiles. This company making huge profit out of supply this market. Okay. So Logic chips is segmented market, low end, high end. So low end market you can enter. That's what China is doing right now. Although they can enter in DRAM. Okay. They are entering low end market of uh, uh, logic chips, ASIC chips, and uh, NAND flashes. Okay. Next. So uh, I'm always getting to end. So if I summarize uh, summary for semiconductors, First, you can see USC measures resulted in important impact in three types of IC chips market. First, it slowed down significantly, speed of China catching up, and possibly to leapfrog. China having difficulty, real difficulties. And increased the status of East Asian company like Samsung or Taiwan and so on. Okay. And Samsung doesn't invest its core product DRAM overseas locations. Thus, negatively affected by U.S. measure against investment in China territory. Okay. Whereas Samsung built a more factory foundry in U.S. market, targeting U.S. logic chip market. DRAM, China bigger market. But logic chip, U.S. is bigger market. Okay. TSMC keeps strategy of high-end at home, Taiwan, low-end abroad. So TSMC also keeps high-end process inside Taiwan. 
and invest abroad next generation, one, one generation, two generation, all generation abroad. Okay? So China, uh, Tencent factory in China is uh, two or three generation old one. U.S. they still invest uh, one generation older, but uh, but more the uh, up to date generation because of U.S. pressure and U.S. incentives. But still one generation old. Okay. But China have to uh, focus on low end segment where U.S. restriction is flexible. And the uh, current market demand is strong, at least cheese for cars. Okay. Or they're trying to develop alternative technologies, such as founded for electricity chips using not silicon, but SIC and uh, uh, different technological term. So they're trying to not to use silicon, but using different material technology uh, target their own uh, niche market. And one worry is that maybe too much investment in the US is causing oversupply. When I talk to some people, they don't worry about that because now the semi market is growing, growing. No worry about oversupply for a couple of years. I went to Samsung factory in Korea. They're building more and more factories. <laughs> Huge construction going on. So it's OK for them to have another factory in the US. There's less worry about global overcapacity. Final next. This is general summary. So uh, due to U.S. reaction, China catching up seems to be somewhat derailed or slowing down. So short-term gain U.S., but longer term, we're not sure because China catching up still possible in display, batteries, electric cars. China already number one electric cars. Only problem in semiconductors. That means opportunity for other countries except China. Maybe. Okay. Because uh, we still need a production site, packaging, and so on globally. Okay. Prospect, not full, but partial decoupling between US and China. US even say de-risking using the IPF, which is common network for stable GBC, uh, just in case Chinese uh, uh, abuse some powers in key material, materials. Okay. We are trying to build GBC main high tech manufacturing, but it takes time. US don't have a uh, supply network. Samsung battery US all use Samsung supply from Korea. <laughs> okay. No supply in US territory. So Samsung had to bring their own supplier, SME supplier, from Korea to the Samsung location factory in US. Okay. So US trying to get back to manufacturing, but they all lost memory manufacturing. It still takes time for them to build manufacturing capabilities. Very high cost also. That's problem facing US uh, dream to build back manufacturing uh, value chain. So Korea benefit from IRA, but chips is real distortion because it is not based on economic calculation, but based on security concerns. For security is more important for US than economic profit making. So this is uh, chipset really semiconductor really distorting factor for GBC in semiconductors. So for Korea, it's okay to build another factory in G ES, but it's too much if USA is so you cannot do business in China. China is still big market. It's too much from a Korean point of view. Okay? It's against freedom of business and global standard. So I think finally I have to say we have to restore multilateral and free fair and trade, which is has been engine of growth for the last several decades. We need a more rule-based international system for coexistence with the competition. This is a Korean position, official position. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Nós agradecemos ao professor Kim Lee. Can we first select the professor? And I would like to invite Professor Gustavo Cadeira, professor of the Institute of Mathematics of the Federal University of the State of Rio de He was already responsible by the Secretary of Science Technology and the Laboratory of Computer Science, and he's currently manager of the Center for Advanced Electronic Technology. To begin our debate.
Before we be start this rich and promising debate, we would like to inform you that there will be space for questions uh, from the audience. Uh, one of our hostesses will reach out to you with the microphone so that you can ask your questions and you can also send your questions through the chat and our teams at CGE and MD will direct them to our speakers. Your participation greatly enriches our discussion is extremely important. Professors, we can now begin our debate. Professor, thank you very much for your speech. It was very interesting. I would like to raise some topics more to encourage the debate by the audience and also to instigate a bit your experience on the area. And with that, we have some important uh, lessons that could be applied to our country. What we learned from Professor Lee's speech, he can correct me, obviously, if I am wrong, but that really, first, the scenario of a war, so to speak, a chips, a technological war, it goes much beyond that because this is only one component of this major geopolitical war between the United States and China. But it is interesting from his speech is to note the efforts that Korea, especially Korea and companies such as Samsung, which is one of the largest semiconductor companies in the world, is attempt to survive this conflict, considering that up to then there was uh, an apparent peace around the world in which there was an international market of uh, internationalized value chain. And with that, the companies had were supported and were not much concerned with geopolitical uh, matters. You mentioned, Professor mentions, the issue of the exit from China and one of the Questions I ask myself is, is if this exit, this escape, did it, if it did it have a wrong component because of this conflict with the United States and the U.S. restrictions? But we were had already been observing this exit from from China to Southeast Asia, Vietnam, because of what you called the middle income trap. He uses a very interesting word that I am trying to remember here. The issue is the middle class. There, You reach a point where China has a strong middle class and with that the wages obviously increase and that makes the companies seek countries where labor is less expensive, which is the case of Vietnam. So I, I was, I have visited in the end of the first, China's first decade, I was in China and we could already see this migration from Chinese labor, which was there because it was very inexpensive, moving to Vietnam. Obviously this conflict with the United States contributed a lot to this process. But this speech, Professor Lee's speech, we note what are the dilemmas that a major industry such as Samsung faces and how to survive this world war. And the question is, what effect does this have upon other countries that are less capable in these sectors of semiconductors? Brazil certainly is at a very at a, a beginner's level in worldwide terms, but even the European companies and other uh, attempts in other countries in their attempts to survive. So we clearly see that we are in a geopolitical scenario that is very complex. And the question is, why deep down, how did we arrive here? Because the technological sector became vital for 
uh, country to be hegemonic in this domain. And we clearly see that this is intensified precisely with the, with the battle of cell phone technology when Howie starts to impose itself upon the world as a priority technology and in the area of the 5G. And this makes the United States very concerned, also fed by a movement that I can see in the United States that began with the entire MAGA, Make American Great Again movement to, to not let the United States lose his position as the great economy of the world in confrontation with China's growth. So we acknowledge this geopolitical fight. The question is, how can we survive this? And this makes me think about a question about Brazil. How should Brazil act? Should it align itself? Should it take a side? And as we said here at the beginning, that it, it would not be convenient for us to take a side, but to explore the interests that we could find in each one of these alignments. And that is what we see from Professor Lee's presentation, that Samsung tries to see where it can benefit from. It should, should it distance itself completely from China or should it find within China partnerships that can be more advantageous to it and at the same time maintain investments in the United States with regards to the, the foundries that, that they are building in the United States. What we note lately is that the American companies themselves, and I'm talking about two major American companies, which is Qualcomm and Intel, today they are very concerned with these restrictions that the United States are placing against China because this may cause a break in the value chain. You mentioned the United States value chain and China, but major companies are realizing that this has an impact, a very major impact on their productions because they need, they require different materials coming from China and companies that are already established in China, intellectual property that is in China and in other countries. And at the same time, they see that this will be a barrier. Major companies are seeing that it will be difficult to survive with much benefit to survive this technological war that the United States is beginning against China because of different political reasons. So the question is, how can we take advantage, so to speak, of this context if there is an area, if there is an area that we can explore between these two currents, between these two major companies? On the other hand, we see that the United States, when it refers to nearshore investments, that you are talking about, again, countries that do not have technological capacity or research capacity, but that has more inexpensive labor, which is the case of Mexico. For instance, Mexico does not have any major technological capacity. There are semiconductors, but it is being preferred as one of the places for the United States to invest. The same goes for the history of the growth in Asia, in the case of Taiwan, for instance, and South Korea as well, which in reality they found this intent of the Western countries to invest in their countries. At the same time, they had major technolog technological capacities. They had very skilled persons and capable of implementing companies that today are very successful, such as TSMC, which was really 
is very competent that was in the United States since the beginning of the semiconductor segment development, especially in the area of ships, and that it came to Korea with a strong support with a strong support from Taiwan, this major support from the Taiwanese government is able to create the largest ships manufacturing company in the world today, whereas South Korea, again, took advantage of Samsung's potential and with its technological capacity, they are able to grow, also supported strongly by the government of South Korea. So we see that we see all these strength in play that help to create these major companies. What today I observed from your speech is what is limiting China the most is the high-end technology that requires equipment that is manufactured by SML in the Netherlands, and which is the extreme ultraviolet, but because they are not able to make chips with the dimensions below five nanometers or such without this equipment. And this equipment is something that requires more than 10 years of research and capacity building. And not only that, it requires a value chain that needs contributions from companies from all over the world, considering that uh, equipment EUV has more than half a million components necessary to build this equipment. So it is extremely advanced technology and China has no perspective in the next 10, 20 years, or at least that is what we believe, to be able to manufacture this equipment, the EUV equipment that would be able to take China further. Also bearing in mind that this is necessary also when we talk about memory, more advanced memory chips, DRAM, etc., and the logic chips as well, logic semiconductors, because there we don't need many applications for a chip on this frontier of knowledge. So the question is also if China will explore, I think you mentioned that as well, if China is really going to dedicate itself to those market niches in which there is no need for this high-end technology chip or a very low dimensions. I would just like to raise these general ideas. Obviously, we are open to the audience and our listeners for questions and to raise any other topics. I don't know if Professor Lee wants to make a comment now or do you prefer to listen to other comments that may come from the audience? Okay. Thank you for uh, um uh, raising um, many questions, an important point. Uh, let me try to pick up on several, and uh, we can have more time from Lawrence. Okay. Uh, first of all, I somehow um, let's uh, uh, mention that in this whole situation, who are gaining most, who are benefiting most, which country, company, is the U.S. in general, because of uh, Every country trying to invest in U.S. many uh, high tech sector because of uh, IRA and chip sector. So uh, uh, U.S. become a biggest receiving country of FDI nowadays, especially this year. Okay, that's why U.S. Uh, economy booming with a rising in inflation <laughs> and uh, almost zero unemployment rate, and so on. U.S. economy is uh, booming too much because this is all measures attracting FDA all over the world. Okay, 
although we are not sure whether we actually make success in building up the manufacturing capabilities. Okay. And another, another point I didn't mention is that although the East Asian campaign looks strong in semiconductor, size of benefit or profit is USA's dominant. It's like a Apple but Samsung in mobile phone. Although Samsung sells more unit, physical unit of mobile phone, but in terms of profit, Apple, Apple taking more than 80% of all profit in uh, cell phone industries because they are uh, uh, superior in terms of uh, design and uh, high end and so on. So in semiconductor too, although East Asian companies do product, production, the all software, all the design is done by US companies. So globally, among the 100% of semiconductor profit, U.S. takes more than 60%, 60 But they are not satisfied with this, and they want to bring even manufacturing location into U.S. territory too. In the past, they didn't want to do that, but now they want to do that. And that's the source of all uh, global problem. Okay, so in the same, U.S. trying to get everything into U.S. territory. <laughs> Nothing left to other countries. And that's uh, some problem, although as I mentioned, some country might be uh, benefiting, benefiting from uh, these uh, cases. Okay. So the, the point is that China having real difficulty in catching up in semiconductor because of the, they can import important facilities and software, all dominated by US company in strong monopoly of software in semiconductors. Without software, you cannot update your, your uh, manufacturing facility in semiconductors. Okay. But China is uh, catching up rapidly in other sectors except semiconductors, electric cars, batteries, almost everything. So we'll see. <laughs> expect you to, to make some comments, but let me just, I liked very much the last sentence he did when he said, we need rules-based international systems for uh, coexistence with competition. And I think And I think that that is what is important. We do have an environment that international, international and relations and technological and commercial relations must be based on rules that are well accepted by the major countries. I saw somebody raise their hand here. Is Can you hear me? First, I would like to thank uh, your speech was excellent, very instructive. I would like, if possible, to comment the situation in Brazil because today we have this, we do not have this area well, much developed, so there are efforts such as the Semitech effort. And an example that was given about some countries is that they start simultaneously to apply in low end and high end. In other words, you have a development in low end. In the case of Korea, for instance, it begins with less sophisticated products as well as seeking the leapfrogging. So my question is, in case of Brazil, which today we have an effort in this less sophisticated area, if it would be the case of also trying to invest in some of the frontier topics to eventually be able to catch up faster. First of all, thank you, Mr. Conley. My question refers to what Dr. Hizo said. Basically, there's a consensus that scientific cooperation between countries is essential for the insertion of said countries into the global value chains. 
how do you assess the current scenario in which aspiring countries as Brazil and India find tension not only between the US and China as a new aspiring nation, but also with other players as the countries you mentioned, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, who are consolidated in the global value chains? Because it seems that there are some specificity, specificities of the 21st century. I'd like you to comment a bit on this, trying to align that which you mentioned in your work between the complementary nature of a strategy, a gradual catching up strategy, and a leaping frog, leapfrogging strategy. Just uh, notice we ask that those who are with us on YouTube, that those who, are, who would like to ask questions to the professor can send your questions to the YouTube chat. You would need to update the link so that you can see the chat. Please identify your name and institution. One other question, Professor. My name is Rafael from the Ministry of Development, Industry and Foreign Trade. We talked to you shortly about the ITEF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which intends to substitute part of the trade organization that was supplied by the OMC framework, the, I'm sorry, the WTO framework. During your presentation, Professor, you mentioned arrangements or acts with the intent of excluding China from this GVC. And you identify very well, you have detailed the point of view of a Korean professor and you identify it very well, that you identify if this is good or not for Korea. And I would like to take advantage of your expertise you are a professor, you are a public employee, you are talking to uh, formulators of public policies who oftentimes find in these rules both restraints and incentives for the development of public policies. So this is a very um, uneasy time that rules multilateral relations with discretionary rules. So my question, is what can you say to public policy makers of a developing country that need to live with this? How can we explore these opportunities that are currently present? Or, or you, you want to answer this three and a half? Yeah, maybe three is enough to line now. Is okay. All right. So, uh, let me try to respond this way. First question or second question is, is about leapfrogging uh, possibility or strategy. Uh, um, because uh, East Asian company like uh, Samsung has uh, adopted this strategy of leapfrogging. And it's not simultaneously done. Um, it is sequentially. First, we uh, focused on doing manufacturing or production of global added segment like uh, uh, the fabrication or packaging, after, only after you build up certain experience and capability, you are ready to try leapfrogging. So it's a sequential event, okay? And you need to have two things to try leapfrogging. One is you have built up certain capability from the past, at least manufacturing capability. Second, you got access to facility or machinery from like uh, EUB from abroad. So that condition was met in the case of Samsung in the past. So Samsung built a capability, target next generation, by still relying on import from uh, US, Japan in terms of Netherlands key manufacturing facilities. Okay? And that possibility is now not, now not possible for China because they can import the uh, key technological component of software. But other countries, other emerging countries, even Brazil or Mexico, they, you can try leapfrogging because, but only have to build a certain capability and you get access to the uh, key bottleneck technology pro abroad. Okay, so in the sense, I would say leapfrogging is uh, you can try only after building up certain uh, capabilities. Okay, and then the, this uh, 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 the relation between IPF and uh, free trade regime. 
we don't have to see this as a, a alternative. Now then we can go together. We can have both free trade regime and also IPF. IPF is to kind of uh, safeguard against some uncertainty in uh, key supply. For example, uh, China is a monopoly of many rare material, raw material used, used in uh, batteries or semiconductor. China might abuse its power <laughs> in, a, in, a, in certain context. So in the case, IPF country try to solve this problem among themselves. Okay. There is actual experience like that in the past. South Korea or uh, Australia has some bad experience with China in terms of abusing China's power in certain uh, monopolized supplies. So in that sense, we can go together. We can have both multilateralism and also IPF as a kind of a, uh, safeguard against a possible uncertainty in uh, uh, supply network. And emerging countries, as I mentioned, the Deglobalization might be opportunity because we are giving some police space to build up more domestic capabilities. Okay? In the past, we are all worried about third tiers, any measures, if we try any protectionist or any industrial policies. Now, that worry is gone, right? <laughs> Look at the US, they do everything, okay? So now, emerging countries have more freedom to try their own industrial policies, give them more Polish uh, 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 spaces, and each is uh, maybe we have to avoid too much reliance on global value chain, but it's better to rely more on domestic resources or at least regional resources. So that's why not global value chain, but regional value chain or domestic value chain become important. Okay, so uh, build up some more network. A home or nearby might be important strategy for any emerging countries and so on. Okay. Good afternoon. Professor Luciana, I work in the Brazilian company for research and innovation in Brapi. We have been seeing a separation, as you have shown, China and Southeast Asia in producing goods and semiconductors, the United States with many, many benefits to attract the industries to its country again. This question was somewhat made already, but what is Brazil's role in this contest and what would be, well, markets could Brazil go into in order to be able to take advantage, in fact, of this dispute between these major nations. Does anybody else want to ask a question? Is there any question from the chat? Would you like to place that question? The restriction, the United States restrictions of China developing high-end technology through agreements with Brazil, is there restrictions from the United States? Is there restrictions by the United States for China to develop high-end technology through agreements made with Brazil? Does the United States restrict to China making agreements with Brazil for the development of high-end quality products? Does anybody else? There is one more question. How can Brazil be part of the semiconductors chain? That is the million dollar question that we are trying to answer. Let's listen to Professor Lee. Thank you all, important and tough question. <laughs> Okay, how about what's the role of Brazil? I guess 
um, as I mentioned uh, today, there are two big value chain. One is uh, China Red, and the other is US Red. But I mentioned possibility of third block. As I mentioned, India is a member of Quad, also member of Shanghai Corporation Treaty. Very interesting. And as in general, I see the BRICS is the only possible alternative to, between these uh, two uh, major blocks. BRICS is only possible uh, source of uh, third power block. You have uh, Russia, China, Brazil, and India, and, and you are big enough. So I think that's, that might be the role for not just uh, Brazil alone, but together with the BRICS countries. Okay? It can be an alternative block other than China or US. And uh, now I heard uh, that Rula is proposing um, uh, another currencies, and that's good move, I think. Because there's a big problem with the uh, dollar dominance, monopoly is a big problem. Whenever U.S. In increase interest rate, it sucks up all the money back to U.S. and increase the price of all the food items uh, for the, the facing emerging countries or African countries having difficulty whenever U.S. hike up the interest rate. It's unfair in a sense because U.S. uses interest rate for domestic inflation problem, but without considering global impact of U.S. interest hike, it's, uh, it's not a uh, fair uh, treatment of. It's, it's all from because dollar is used at both domestic currency and both international currencies. It's a, it's, it's a fundamental contradiction, and British might have a role for handling this issue, this contradiction of uh, uh, one currency become a uh, monopoly currency. And uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, I guess there are no uh, restriction against any move by China solving the problem with the cooperation with the BRICS or Brazil. I think it's China's. Uh, so China might. So in the past, China was very aggressive, almost another imperialist uh, country like US. But China become now getting more modest <laughs> nowadays. Mm -hmm. So they are looking for partners, friends. Okay, and so in the sense. Uh, China looking for help from other countries and uh, Brazil other country can be a uh, better position in terms of bargaining power handling China than before I guess. Okay. And uh, uh, also uh, uh, Brazil other big country trying to look more regional value chain rather than just global. Okay. So uh, local or regional market is important. Okay. Brazil has somewhat trapped in your big domestic market, but I hope that can be more outbound, at least targeting the, uh, doing more regional cooperation, at least in Latin Americans. I would like to add a few comments. We noticed that with semiconductors, we are not only creating a factory or investing in a manufacturing plant in a production unit. It also requires, uh, and Professor Lee has placed this very clearly in his remarks, we have two aspects. One is are the factories that are, exist, and the other, the GVC of the entire value chain that exists and is necessary to nurture this process. And that is what is carrying the United States today. China has a participation in this GVC, including of material and supplies that are used for the manufacturing of semiconductors and chips. So when China leaves that position, the value chain tends to be impoverished. And he, Professor Li mentioned that in this division between the GVC of China and of, of American, so the G2 and S2. So in my understanding, Professor Lee, it seems that this is extremely difficult to take place because they are very interdependent. These two value chains are very interdependent, and I'm not sure how the United States will be able to split from this, and that is what is currently a, uh, calling our attention. And also Intel is attracting the attention of the US government. I think it is much more complex than we previously thought of it as being. The second topic is a bit uh, as to the response of what chance we have in being inserted in this value chain. Is we notice that in all of these countries, and as the professor mentioned, we mentioned we see the importance of creating, uh, building technological competencies, domestic competencies, 
so that we have domestic persons capable of uh, producing this. And that is what we do have in Brazil for us to build up this capacity and develop effectively as an important player in the world scenario. I was seeing, for example, TSNC has 10,000 researchers. And we can see that Syntec had 175. But you can say, well, how can you compete with TSNC? We would not want to do so. We're, and no one would be able to do so. But that clearly shows the intensity of the technological capacity that is necessary for us to sustain a large semiconductor companies. We, we're talking about 10,000 uh, researchers in the TSMC. These are just uh, general comments. I'm not sure if Professor Lee would like to add something or if we have reached the end of our time. I am not controlling our time. We have one more question coming in through the chat. This is Leonardo from CFET in the state of Rio. The existence of SATEC is in its on its own heroic. In light of this, how much investment and time would it would be necessary for Brazil to overcome this delay uh, in comparison to the United States and South Korea? I am not sure if Professor Lee would like to answer this. The United States in, in, in China, or, or Taiwan, or, or Korea. In reality, this is something In fact, allow me to comment that truly this is a great challenge for the entire world. <clears throat> We have only three large uh, companies in the world. No one wants to get to that point. That will take 20 years and a lot of investments. What we want is to generate competencies and capacity in the sector so that we can fulfill market niches that do not require that level of competence. And that is basically relative to cell phones and to personal computers, which uh, need these chips, in addition to other very uh, specific applicabilities. Please, Professor Lee. Eu gostaria de acrescentar um outro ponto que que apesar de estarmos conversando sobre o manufaturamento e a capacidade de fabricação, agora, hoje em dia, neste mundo incerto de disrupção, estamos encontrando a falta de minerais, de produtos aqui no Brasil e em outros países da América, da América Latina. Vocês têm poder de barganha? bastante importante, cada vez mais forte, em função do, da matéria bruta que vocês têm aqui, que são necessárias para o processamento destes minérios, destes minerais, perdão, destes produtos que são necessários para a fabricação. Então, neste sentido, países ricos em recursos no sul global estão numa posição melhor do que estavam antes para tomarem proveito de su, seus recursos naturais como ferramentas de barganha para atrair... Uh, atrair parcerias, enfim, atrair parcerias de FDI. Eu acho que o Brasil tem estrutura muito equilibrada em termos do seu, do seus, dos seus recursos naturais e assim por diante. Então, vocês estão numa posição muito melhor do que vários outros países do sul global. Precisam desenvolver uma estratégia de longo prazo e na edificação, na construção de capacidades em termos de do exemplo da Samsung no passado, a Samsung passou para este alto segmento de pesquisa e desenvolvimento e de produtos de alto valor, mas antes desenvolveram muito em P&D e da cadeia de valores, ou seja, não, não podemos... Em termos de tomada de risco e recursos necessários, então, os laboratórios de pesquisa trabalham em conjunto para o desenvolvimento de chips. Então, 
precisa haver uma parceria público-privada para construir a capacidade para compartilhar o risco, compartilhar, compartilhar as oportunidades e riscos. Não apenas dar dinheiro, mas precisamos fazer uma rede comum de aprendizado entre o setor privado e o setor público. Para expandir a inovação, os recursos, o conhecimento. Quando a gente compartilha o conhecimento, ele aumenta. Se nós compartilhamos recursos, eles diminuem, mas quando compartilhamos recursos, eles, perdão, o conhecimento ele aumenta. Ok, uh, I will ask in English, I think the translator is not working, is working. A, tra a tradução está funcionando? Ah, então vou fazer em português. <laughs> Good afternoon, thank you for your space. My name is Daniela, I'm from the Federal University of Brasilia. I was thinking during your speech, if these restrictive policies that the United States have placed to hinder China's progress in semiconductor chains, if they are negatively impacting multinational companies' businesses, and if these companies can legally fight against these United States restrictive policies. I was asking about if these restrictive policies that the USA is making against China, maybe that, that can affect the business of the big companies and they will try to overcome these regulations and try to do business as well. Talvez você esteja mencionando o caso de empresas americanas de semicondutores reclamando sobre seus próprios governos. Eles estavam uh, fazendo dinheiro com relações comerciais com a China. Então, é um dilema que o governo enfrenta, porque se as empresas americanas não explorarem o mercado chinês, estão perdendo muitos recursos principalmente na tentativa de encontrar recursos alternativos. Isso não é bom. Então, eles estão usando outros mercados, outras economias. Isso é muito ruim. Então, mas o governo dos Estados Unidos está pressionando isso porque, porque agora a preocupação maior é a segurança nacional e não a economia. É por isso... Que, que os Estados Unidos está pressionando, está pressionando seu Conselho Nacional de Segurança. Então, é difícil como isso está sendo lidado pelas empresas, porque hoje, bem, as intervenções nessa tecnologia de semicondutores, você tem, uh, você tem o poder. Os Estados Unidos está pensando no horizonte em 10 anos, 20, 30 anos, nessa cadeia de valores. Então, a prioridade norte-americana no momento é na segurança e não na economia. É que o nosso tempo terminou. E eu, como é que nós fazemos agora? Chamamos de volta o Fernando aqui. Nós vamos, vamos convidar para uma mesa de encerramento. Convido o doutor Fernando Riso, que é diretor-presidente do Centro de Gestão e Estudos Estratégicos. E convido também o doutor Wallace Moreira Lima, secretário de Desenvolvimento Industrial, Comércio, Serviços e Inovação, eu passo a palavra para o doutor Fernando Rizzo. Bom, inicialmente, muito obrigado aí pela é, palestra, doutor Kiyun Eli. Foi realmente muito importante conhecer a situação de fato, quer dizer, de um país que na década de 70 estava muito próximo à situação do Brasil, e que nós vimos ao longo desses anos decolar né, e nos deixar numa posição bem, vamos dizer assim, desfavorável. É, 
eu acho que foi muito importante, porque é uma área de grande competição, né, como nós vimos. Eu achei interessante o lance, como ele foi, comentou, como cada país descobriu o seu nicho, né, importante o caso de Taiwan, né, o, o Gadelha comentou, que é um país relativamente, quer dizer, bem pequeno, é, e que eu lembro na época da Acer também, quer dizer, que era um computador, e eles realmente, o país se dedicou a fazer uma competição a nível internacional, né? e hoje domina, né? com essa TSMC, a produção de chips né? com é, dimensões nanométricas abaixo de 10 nanômetros, eu fiquei até impressionado, 2, 3, eu sou da área de materiais, eu sei como é que isso é complicado. Né? É, teve um, um momento em que o comprimento da luz é que determinava né? o, o, o o tamanho do dispositivo e com essas técnicas de interferência tudo eles conseguem fazer esse milagre é, mas de qualquer maneira eu acho que, que existe lições o caso da Holanda também né que resolveu essa área de litografia de se dedicar e realmente ocupar uma posição de destaque é, e o Brasil nós temos essa dificuldade que os valores colocados são realmente quando a gente considera né o exemplo que o Gadelha deu é muito é, é realmente preocupante né os Estados Unidos estão investindo da ordem de 30 bilhões de dólares atualmente só, quer dizer, 50 bilhões de dólares daquele grande projeto dele só para essa área. Né? Então é, é chato ficar só falando em termos de números, mas mostra só que a gente tem que cada vez mais fazer, quer dizer, fazer mais com menos. Né? Mas de qualquer maneira foi um prazer é, escutar o doutor Kim Oli, né? queria agradecer aqui em nome do CGE a oportunidade de tê-los aqui, agradecer ao, ao, ao Wallace pela... É, a sugestão do seu nome foi muito importante, né? Ao Midic, que abraçou a ideia também é, conosco. Eu espero, viu, Wallace, que a gente possa estreitar essa relação entre o MCTI e o Midic. Eu acho que tem tudo a ver, nós temos muitas coisas em comum. E certamente, se a gente trabalhar junto, o caminho ficará mais fácil. Né? Então, queria agradecer aqui a presença de todos, né? É, e desejar ao doutor Kim Lee uma passagem aqui pelo Brasil, muito ele já teve aqui no Brasil outras vezes, mas em Brasília é a primeira, né? então eu espero que ele aproveite mais uma vez essa visita aqui ao nosso país e volte outras vezes. Okay? Muito obrigado. Neste momento tem a palavra o secretário de Desenvolvimento Industrial, Comércio, Serviço e Inovação, doutor Wallace Moreira Lima. Tá ligado, tá. Ok. Eu queria parabenizar o CGE. Eu acho de extrema relevância, importância o evento. Agradecer profundamente ao presidente Fernando Rizzo pela generosidade de ter organizado o evento, de ter nos consultado enquanto MDIC, né, em fazer essa, esse evento com uh, o MCTI, CGE. Né, e MDIC, e são três, dois ministérios e uma, uma organização social que tem como norte a mesma temática de um projeto de governo, que é o fortalecimento da indústria no Brasil, uma retomada da, da indústria, né, aquilo que o, o vice-presidente, ministro Geraldo Alckmin, vem chamando de neo-industrialização. Então, acho que este evento, de certa forma, ele é um resumo daquilo que nós estamos defendendo, construindo, é, com 21 ministérios, mais o BNDES e mais 21 representantes da sociedade civil no Conselho Nacional de Desenvolvimento Industrial, que é coordenar, né, construir uma política pública para a retomada da indústria instalada no Brasil, tanto de empresas nacionais como empresas estrangeiras, principalmente com o objetivo de fortalecer as capacidades nacionais. Nós temos muita clareza, e aí eu acho que a apresentação do professor Lee é fundamental nesse sentido, que um dos princípios fundamentais para o catch-up tecnológico é a construção e o fortalecimento das capacidades nacionais. E talvez, e possivelmente, uma das grandes contribuições que o governo Lula pode oferecer ao Brasil é a retomada dessas construções, da construção dessas capacidades nacionais. Eu quero agradecer profundamente ao professor Augusto Gadelha né, pela generosidade em participar dessa mesa. E mais ainda também quero agradecer profundamente a generosidade do professor Canli em ter vindo a Brasília né, fazer essa apresentação. Eu tive o privilégio de ficar um tempo, uma temporada na Coreia do Sul, 
né? sou muito uh, grato e feliz por ter vivido um momento muito importante uh, da minha vida né? na Coreia do Sul, aprendi muito com o professor, né? tive o privilégio de trazer todo uh, esse aprendizado para o Ministério, na função de secretário, uh, vem tentando construir e elaborar essa política junto com os meus é, amigos, colegas e parceiros do Ministério, aqui tem vários deles, não citaria os nomes para não ser injusto, né? mas tem uma equipe de excelência trabalhando no MDIC comigo, na Secretaria de Desenvolvimento Industrial, Inovação, Comércio e Serviços, né, que contribuem, corroboram e acreditam muito nesse projeto e, sem dúvida nenhuma, esse, esse momento aqui foi fundamental para alimentar os nossos anseios e pensamentos para construir esse projeto de neoindustrialização. Obrigado, professor Lee. E neste momento, eu passo para as suas palavras de encerramento, o professor Augusto César Gadelha. Primeiro, agradecer aos organizadores do evento e ao secretário Wallace o convite de estar aqui participando desse evento, junto com o professor Lee, e ter a oportunidade realmente de tentar criar um, um debate sobre essa questão de semicondutores e da inserção do Brasil dentro dessa cadeia. Ah, eu acredito que foi muito produtivo para todos e o professor Li realmente a palestra mostra exatamente esse, esse contexto de um conflito internacional que está afetando todos os países né? e está alertando todos os países em buscar soluções específicas é, para dentro desse conflito aí, como é que eles sobrevivem a isso. Eu acho que a Coreia, a Samsung, etc., estão buscando essa solução e estão encontrando o caminho. E nós temos que encontrar o nosso caminho aqui no Brasil, no, no contexto desse, dessa nova realidade geopolítica mundial. Né? Então, eu agradeço novamente, muito obrigado. Eu acho que foi é, um, um, um sucesso... Professor Lia, sua palestra, e muito obrigado por estar aqui conosco. Muito obrigado. Neste momento, tem a palavra de encerramento o professor Kim Li. Muito obrigado. É, foi um prazer para mim estar aqui, é uma oportunidade excelente para mim também. Já estive em várias cidades no Brasil, São Paulo, Rio... Campinas e Belo Horizonte, mas é a primeira vez na capital. Estou muito impressionada para as suas cidades e no seu empenho em desenvolver capacidades para o seu país. O mercado não é mágica, precisa de ajuda do governo e precisa de orientação. E o Catching Up exige capacitação, mas é preciso estar aberto para capital de conhecimento de fora, aprender como se tornar melhor e como utilizar para o bem das suas companhias domésticas. Essa é a parte mais difícil. Se você fechar o mercado, então não vai funcionar. Temos que abrir o mercado. Abrir também não é uma garantia de sucesso. É preciso ter manipulação estratégica das oportunidades e da abertura com a ajuda dos outros, mas também fortalecendo as suas próprias capacidades. Acho que essa é a lição final em termos de recuperação do catch-up, que não é fácil. Muito obrigado. Thank you. And we hope this discussion has inspired new perspectives. We wish you all well. See you next time. Você passa no
Obrigado pelo parabéns pelo evento. É uma honra ser. Eu sou de Tiago Civil. Muito prazer. Eu chamo Antônio, sou representante da Amazônia, do lado. Esse é o desenvolvimento nosso.